Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's panel discussion webinar. It's titled A Path Forward, Reflections on Patient Safety, Trust Culture, and the Nursing Profession After the Redonda Vought Conviction. I'm Mark Raven, a senior advisor with Kinexus. I'm going to be the moderator today, and I want to quickly introduce, we have an esteemed panel of clinicians and leaders with us here today. Um, first off is Dr. Greg Jacobson. He is the CEO and co-founder of Kinexus, and he is an emergency medicine physician still practicing today. We're also joined by Kelly Reap. She is a clinical nurse specialist who works in clinical, uh, critical care. Uh, among other things, she was the nurse consultant for a multiplayer board game titled Critical Care, The Game. We're also joined by uh, Dr. Brian Wyrick. He is the chief nursing officer for Banner Health's Thunderbird Hospital. He has a doctorate degree in health administration from the Medical University of South Carolina and a master's degree in healthcare administration from Ohio University, where he also obtained his bachelor degree in nursing. And then we also have Rebecca Love. She is an experienced nurse executive. Um, she was the first nurse featured on TED.com. You can find her TED Talk out there if you search uh, the TED.com website. And she is currently the, the chief clinical officer of IntelliCare, Inc., so um, I'm just going to make a, a couple quick comments and then um, turn things over to Kelly to give people more background for those who are not familiar with the case that we're talking about today. And then more broadly, um, what we can or should be doing moving forward. So a lot of the discussion is going to be based off of one case that involves one patient who unfortunately, um, sadly died. And one nurse who was not only fired, but she lost her license, got prosecuted, and was convicted of a crime. So we're going to talk about that, but again, we're going to be looking forward to with ideas about what we can do to address what's actually a broader patient safety problem. It's not just one rare case. There are various estimates of harm um, re related to patients in the United States. There are similar numbers, order of magnitude is about the same around the world when you look at per capita rates of harm and deaths that are considered to be the result of medical error or preventable medical error. Is this number from different estimates 98,000 Americans a year? Is it 250,000 Americans a year? Is it, as one estimate and study suggests, could be up to 440,000 deaths a year? Are preventable medical errors the third leasing cause of death? Either way, regardless of what the exact number is, and I think the fact that we go off of estimates points to um, a lack of transparency of what the actual numbers are, but I think we would all agree here it is a huge problem, but the causes of harm are, are very much preventable. So with, with that teeing up of kind of the, the, the broader discussion, and I know our panel will bring things back to the broader issues at hand. We do want to start um, with, with Kelly Reap, who is going to give um, kind of an overview of what happened in the specific case involving the nurse Redonda Vought. Kelly? Hey, thanks. Um, yes, I'm Kelly Reap. I'm a clinical nurse specialist. I work in critical care and um, I'm going to try to give a brief overview. Um, it's a very complex timeline, and I will refer you to the Tennessean is a great resource. It's there. I believe it's a uh, newspaper there in um, Nashville. But if you see me look over, it's because I've taken notes to try to make this short. So Redonda Vaught is a former ICU nurse who worked at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And in 2017, she made a fatal medical error that resulted in the death of 75-year-old Charlene Murphy. Murphy was a patient who had been in the ICU but was now uh, on step-down status, and she was awaiting a PET scan. Um, it's an imaging scan in an area of the hospital that had no staff nurses, no Pixis machine, and no medication barcode scanning capability. So. Uh, she was claustrophobic, she was worried, and the technicians thought that they might have to cancel the test if we didn't get some medication for the patient. <clears throat> so Mrs. Murphy's primary nurse was Ethan, and he obtained an order from the physician for Versed, which is an IV anti-anxiety medication that would have a fast action. 
So normally Ethan as the primary nurse would take the medication to the patient. However, he was covering another nurse's patients for lunch. And so he couldn't leave the floor. So he asked Vaught, who was actually serving in sort of a resource role, they called it the help all nurse, and she would float around and do different tasks. And she also had a trainee with her that day. So he asked Vaught to help out and she grabbed a baggie with her to put the syringe, the alcohol swab and the needle that she would need along with the medication because she knew those supplies were not downstairs in the PET scan area. The problem came when Vault tried to access the Pixis. You have to understand a little background. The Pixis is um, an automated drug dispensing machine where a nurse types in a patient's name and then gets access to a limited number of medications that are just prescribed for that patient. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, however, um, they had just rolled out a new computer system, and there was um, a problem with interoperability between the computer and the Pixis machine. And in fact, the staff had been told by a pharmacy that they may have to override frequently during this time. Um, so her next step, when she went under the patient's profile, she did not find the medication listed. So she uh, went into the override function, which allowed her to access all the medications um, in the Pixis with an alphabetic search. So again, instead of limited medications, you have access to all the medications. Um, it was also the way the machine was designed is that you would only have to type in two letters. So she didn't need to type in Versed, she just needed to type VE and all the medications would come up. Unfortunately, the first medication that appeared was not Versed, which is for anxiety, but it was Vecuronium, which is a rarely used medication that is a paralytic mainly designed to help intubate people who are going to be put on a breathing machine because a paralytic will cause you to not be able to breathe. Um, unfortunately, she was distracted talking to her trainee. She did not notice that it was vecuronium and she chose that medication. Um, apparently, there were also a number of warnings that were on the screen, but nurses get in the habit of overriding those warnings because we have multiple warnings that we see throughout the day. Um, she pulled the medication out of the Pixis, noticed that it needed to be reconstituted, which again should have been a flag that um, it was the wrong medication. But again, um, it didn't sink in that it was the wrong medication. And she took it downstairs where um, she administered it to Mrs. Murphy in the PET scan area, gave what she thought was one milligram, and then left the patient there because she had another task that she needed to do in the ED. Um, it wasn't until 30 minutes later that the PET scan technician went into the holding area where Mrs. Murphy was and discovered that she wasn't breathing. A code blue was called and the patient was rushed back to the ICU. They were able to get a pulse back, but um, the damage had been done. She had profound neurological deficits at that time. The mistake was discovered when Redonda came back to the ICU on hearing the code blue and she reached in her pocket and pulled out that bag that contained all the medication. And the reason it didn't get thrown away is because Versed is one of those controlled substances that need to be wasted. It has to have a witness in the Pixis, which also tells us that she really thought this was Versed. Unfortunately, it was not. And the other nurse noticed this. And then they immediately, Redonda went immediately to the physician, told the physician what had happened um, and told her management team. The next day, the family withdrew care from Mrs. Murphy because of her poor neurological prognosis. So in the aftermath of that, um, the hospital fired Redonda the next week. Um, the, the hospital also settled out of court with Mrs. Murphy's family for an undisclosed amount of money and um, also had them sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, they also, Vanderbilt also failed to report the Sentinel event to CMS, even though they are required to do that by law. The physician, there was no mention of vecuronium being a cause of death on the death certificate. And so uh, it was listed as a natural cause of death and the patient did not have an autopsy. The medical examiner did not review the patient. Even more unfortunate, uh, there was no policy or practice change that was instituted by the hospital in the wake of this error until October of that year when an anonymous whistleblower filed a complaint with CMS that caused them to have a surprise on-site visit with Vanderbilt. 
and they found so many patient safety violations that it placed the hospital in immediate jeopardy uh, for their reimbursement status. And that status was only restored when they hastily put together an over 100 page uh, plan of correction that also that included things like having a nurse, having a Pixis in the PET scan area. Um, so it was about this time that was about 2018 when it became public because of the CMS finding. That's how the media found out. Um, at that point, the DA's office decided to charge uh, Vaught with reckless homicide. Even though it's important to know the family of Charlene Murphy did not want the nurse uh, to be prosecuted. And um, CMS, the investigator, had said that Vanderbilt had so much burden that they were almost equally, equally wrong in what had happened and shared the blame for Mrs. Murphy's death. So the reason this is on all of our minds now, and I'm almost finished, is that uh, just this past March, um, Vault's trial was held. It was a three-day trial. And Vault was found guilty of a lesser charge of negligent homicide and abuse of an impaired adult. Uh, but those both can still carry up to six years of prison time. And she's out and will be sentenced in May. Hey, Kelly, thank you for that overview. I want to invite the rest of the panel. Um, you know, what were your, you know, what additional points or reactions you have from, you know, the, the details of this case as you understand them? Brian? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go in here. Um, you know, when I first heard of this case in you know 2017, it didn't really uh, resonate like it did when the conviction happened um, last month. Um, and the reason I think this elicited such a response in me personally, because when I think about the healthcare industry, I think the worst possible scenario is where we live in a culture um, across the industry where clinicians um, of every title are purposefully and intentionally not reporting errors or near misses when they happen. Um, that's worst case scenario for me. That causes me a lot of, um, up to lose a lot of sleep. And this conviction, I think, puts us in a step in that direction. And that's why this, um, as opposed to anything else that we've seen in the last couple of years, um, I think is such a big deal. And to follow up on Brian, Mark, um, as you mentioned, medical errors are perverse in our, our nature. And the truth is, is that when we start criminally prosecuting nurses uh, for mistakes that were, are unintentional in nature, which means there's no intended intent in this situation to cause harm, but can result in a criminal prosecution, not only is what to Brian's point going to push these medical errors from being reported, it's also going to take those nurses to say, did the risk and the consequences for being a nurse become too great for me as a nurse to continue to practice. Now, that's bad because we knew in 2017, we had a nursing shortage. We knew when COVID hit, we had the largest exodus from the profession. Before this verdict happened, we had estimated 500,000 more nurses were going to exit the profession by the end of the year, averaging and moving up that 1.1 million nursing shortage to hit now by the end of 2023. But now the McKenzie report coming out still before this conviction happened, showing one in three bedside nurses is thinking of leaving. The reality is, did we just make nursing so dangerous that anybody who is left by the bedside is going to wonder if they should stay? And I think as nurses, we all knew, as you mentioned when we introduced, that we could lose our license, lose our job, lose our livelihood if we made a mistake. We were willing to own that as nurses. But I don't know if any of us were willing to own that we could be criminally charged lose our freedom, and then any ability to really have a functional life after such a prosecution ever again. So that, to me, is the risk of what's going on here and why we're here talking about this today. Yeah. But Dr. Jacobson. So I think what's what's interesting, so I'm, I'm kind of writing the big topics, um, the effect on uh, um, nursing and i'll immediately say so rebecca and i we were we were chatting a couple weeks ago and uh, pretty early on she said oh did you hear about you know the the um rhodonic um case that that just and i was like oh yeah and she's like oh really and um and I was like, of course um because to me whether it's a nurse or whether it's a respiratory therapist or a physician really anyone practicing um from, from my perspective, we're all part of the exact same team. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't draw any distinction 
um, between uh, um, kind of who, who was the, the essentially the hot potato in a um, in a long line of, of errors because um, it it literally could have been it could have been a um, it could have been a physician that was going down with the patient and was handed a medication and and you know uh, or even drew up the medic. I mean, it just it really almost even doesn't matter that it's a nurse. I, I think it's it's really just that it, it's a practitioner. It's a clinician, and so um, and so kind of as we're as we're letting this conversation evolve, there's the there's the effect on kind of nursing from the standpoint of um, um, of just simply having enough people to do a critical uh, thing that we need. There is going to be the effect of um, um, of of really I think worsening a culture that, that already is pretty bad. Um, if let's just take any of those numbers, you said what, Mark, hundred thousand, four hundred thousand. Let's just take that, it's up to four hundred and forty thousand. Right. Well, what's the lowest years? number? I think the the lowest number in the Institute of Medicine report twenty years ago was about forty four thousand. So forty. Let's just take the lowest number. Um, if you divide that over three hundred sixty five days, you know that's that means a hundred people a day mm-hmm. um, could be potentially um, dying from medical errors. So. The reality is, is that probably in multiple hospitals on that very same day, medical errors resulted in people's death. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, there, there just isn't anyone that's actually practiced medicine that has not been in a situation where they witness a near miss or they witness an error. And it's like, oh, well, I mean, that's just going to be way too much work to, to, to deal with this. And then all the repercussions and just the, the number of times. And so um, kind of Further perpetuating this negative culture is, um, I, I can't imagine the people that were involved in the case thought they were actually doing harm, but um, right. the amount of harm they actually did is, is it's, it's, it's really hard to quantify. Yeah. And, you know, not, not, none of us are doctors, but Rebecca, you used the word, you know, uh, negligent. And, 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 you know, I don't think there was anybody who argued that there was intent. Um, like if somebody, I don't, I don't know if this is a fair parallel. If somebody drives drunk, and kill somebody, they might be charged with negligent homicide. They didn't intend to kill somebody, but their actions of driving drunk should have been known to be such a risk. I think that's where society looks to convict somebody or you know protect that drunk, uh, protect others from that drunk driver. But those things don't line up here. Where you know should Redonda Vaught have known there was such risk? Um, does convicting Redonda Vaught protect? others from her? Well, there, there was no other harm she could do, right? We, you know, I think one of the frustrations for um, those of us that watched the trial was that the prosecution chose as an expert nurse witness, someone who didn't even know the definition of just culture, mm-hmm. um, had never heard of just culture, had not used um, ethic, you know, got out of nursing, you know, when ethics started and really didn't understand the complexities of healthcare today. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, th- I just think it, of the saying that nurses are at the sharp end of the stick. You know, there's a blunt end of the stick where a lot of things happened, you know, administration and how we build systems and how we build the pixels, but it rolls down onto the shoulders of a nurse. And if a nurse has to be hyper vigilant her entire career, her or his entire career, that's nobody can do that. And that's why you eventually begin because, because it's very easy from the outside to go, how in the world did she reconstitute that medication and not know that it wasn't Versed, I can tell you that you have to drown out so much just to be able to do your job that it's very easy to do. And sometimes I'm distressed when I hear the nurses who say, it's just the five rights. It's the five rights of medication. And the five rights is not um, a tool for doing something correctly. It's really sort of a structure that's supposed to be in place for nurses to do their job correctly. And it, it seems like there were many systemic factors as you recapped, Kelly, I've heard some say, well, if the system had required three letters instead of two for the override, she wouldn't have pulled the wrong medication. Should the paralytic, if you said, if, if so rarely used in that setting, why was it so readily available? I'm, and I see Rebecca, you nodding your head. I don't know if you want to add to that or talk about other systemic factors that helped even make this possible, this error, what made the error possible? 
Yeah, no, and I, I'll definitely turn this over to Brian because I, you know, being on the front lines of overseeing a large hospital system, but there's something referred to as what's called the Swiss cheese model, which is, you know, everything seems to have a stopgap at some certain point, but in these moments of these highly complex systems, let's be honest, the World Health Organization is called healthcare systems highly complex because of the degree of complexity that relies upon systems that don't talk to each other, um, medications and highly fragmented relationships between a number of providers that have to manage these things. And when those holes align in that Swiss cheese, an error is inevitable for happening because you saw these magnitudes of systemic failures that were occurring in this. As she was down in there talking to somebody, there isn't a scanner. There's no way to check. They're out rolling a new implementation of Epic. The system isn't talking to the Pixis. The Pixis is allowing for these overrides. This paralytic medication that should have been wrapped now with today's guidelines in a much more significant warning is a situation that allows for these opportunities to happen. And when they say, well, you know what? She ignored these warnings. Kelly will always speak to when we as nurses, even pull up insulin, we're going to get hit with five warnings to get that. There's such a thing that's called alarm fatigue, in which nurses are dealing with alarms constantly to tell them, stop, 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 in every emergent reaction that they are. And they're being told, hurry, hurry, hurry on the back end, because a patient's life is at risk. There's more to manage. And the systems that are in place keep failing us. They create more block stops as opposed to real safety nets that prevent us from making these errors. Often they just create more errors and more workarounds for us in a way that a system is not looking at the end user, but largely mitigating a problem for one unique experience in which those systems don't allow. So the Swiss cheese models here, but Brian, talk to us about what's going on and, and how you what you guys did about this situation. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And that's a, a, a great summary. You hit some high points there. Um, for one, uh, I heard you mention healthcare is a, is a highly complex organization. There is a lot of moving parts uh, and it's hard to get everybody on the same page, but we need to identify these and kind of learn from these. And you also mentioned individual failures and then system failures. And we need to identify those and mitigate those. So like what have we done um, here at Banner Health System? So we kind of look at these uh, in two different parts, right? Yeah. The first are, you know, policies, practices, and protocols. How can we prevent this from happening? We do not want this to happen, period. Um, and then the second part is, it, if this does happen, how can we learn from this and how can we um, how do we lead through this with the, the patient, the family, um, and then also uh, the caregiver involved? There's something out there called the, the second victim mentality. And uh, Redonda herself, they need support. Um, if you've seen anything, you'll see she is extremely remorseful. Uh, I'm not sure what support she has had or what she has now. But um, so to go back to the kind of the prevention side, <clears throat> uh, a lot of this is cultural driven. And I'm happy, you know, at, at Banner Health, you know, our two top physician leaders, our chief clinical officer and our vice president of quality and safety, they came out right away and said, you know, what, we're going to double down on safety, really as a response to this case. So as a clinician, top to bottom, you want to hear that, like, hey, we're, we're going to take this, make this a priority. We're going to double down. Uh, what does that look like? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind are really the high reliability principles. We are a high reliability organization. We are on an evolving high reliability journey. <clears throat> So there's those five principles uh, Two come to mind right now. One is preoccupation with failure. Okay. So is everybody aware and thinking about the potential for failure in every nook and cranny of the healthcare organization? And in this case, you know, it's a procedural area, probably down in the basement or lower level. It's not by the front door. Um, and to do, you know, as you're measuring this, what can go, go wrong? Sorry, we measure this a lot in like near miss events. Uh, and I think I heard Dr. Jacobson mention that. Um, so we have a near miss event. A near miss, this is the, the check engine light in the car, right? So we, we didn't have the outcome we have in this case, but we could have. Um, this is the check engine light. The warning lights are going off. Um, you have to have a process for this. You can't just say we report these events and the amount of number we have every month is what we measure. No, what, what's the quality? Uh, what, what are these events telling us? Um, and then you, you dive into the individual failure versus system failures, and you mitigate. We, we are part of a banner as part of a very large health system. We expect all almost 30 hospitals to be doing this, and then we share best practices across the board. So one of our facilities in Colorado can have a near miss and be like, oh, my gosh, you know, we've got Vecaronium and Verset side by side in the Pixis machine. These are lookalike, soundalike drugs. And everybody's saying, okay, let's mitigate that right now um, to prevent it from happening. Number two uh, from high reliability is really a sensitivity to operations. Mm -hmm. um, th this is the big picture understanding, uh, situational awareness to the day. Um, this elevator is down, uh, but also there's a shortage of this drug. And now we're going to be using this instead. Everybody needs to know that. So we just in the last month has, have revamped our daily 
our daily huddles across the system, across six states. Um, they're all going to do it the same. Uh, we're trying to make it more efficient, but to really focus on safety and really what if anything's going to go wrong today, what's going to go wrong, and let's let's mitigate that immediately. Yeah. Um, so we're focusing on that. And, you know, we do monitor these metrics. How are we doing? We do, um, you know, we want the number of near miss events to, to go up. We are afraid this case will make it go down. So we're, we're monitoring that very closely. Uh, so that's high reliability. And then um, I won't go through the other principles, but, you know, the technology, the barcode met administration, if you don't have it yet, yet you should have it. Um, and in this case, they had it, but they weren't using it that day. And if you're a hospital that uses lane principles, this is where, you know, you should stop the line. You know, where are we at risk? Um, and then uh, <clears throat> to go through that, and again, with the technology, anyone who's bringing kind of virtual nursing in to have a second set of eyes, you know, I'm not hearing that much in the procedural area, but that's important. And we're kind of evolving because there is a shortage. And what, what technology can we use to benefit us? Not just whatever shiny this week, but what can we really use? And mm -hmm. so those are some of the things I won't go through more, but just kind of our prevention. So then on the backside, we have all this stuff in place. We're trying to learn every day. Um, and, uh, I see a comment, you're getting, getting pushed back. I, I agree. I think it all kind of bubbles up to the just culture. You have to have nurses and physicians on the same page, you know, whether that's doing team steps together or whatever you're rolling out, it, it does come down to culture and it's holding people accountable. Uh, on the other side, an event does happen. What can we put in place, to, um, to for, for a support system? So at Banner, we have what's called the Candor process. This is the family notification for any unanticipated outcome that brings harm to a patient. We want a team pulled together, led by a physician, but with like a care team uh, within 24 hours to notify the, the family of what happened. Again, not this doesn't always result in death, but a med error or um, wrong site surgery, anything you can imagine that would happen in healthcare. You know, for us, it would be this process of notifying the family within 24 hours. And then we focus on the caregiver <clears throat> who was involved. This is the second victim mentality that I had mentioned. Uh, we've got a process we call Talk to Me. Uh, it's an acronym for trust, awareness, listening, kindness uh, to me. And again, this is a team of experts. Uh, we're trying to get everybody trained, kind of in the train the trainer model. Um, but this is a team and doesn't have, you don't have to self report. It can be anybody. Hey, I need to, I need to talk to me here to talk to Rebecca today. Cause I know you, um, even just dealt with the, uh, you had a bad day. Uh, you work in NICU and you had an unfortunate outcome error or not, you know, we, we need to have support. This is a really tough environment that we're putting our caregivers through. Uh, and especially through COVID having that support system in place, um, after the fact, um, I think is crucial to success. I want to ask a follow-up question of the group back to just culture, because my understanding of just culture, it does look for, is there intent to harm? If there was intent to harm, yes, you would punish, fire, license gone, what have you. Nobody has ever accused Redon Devot of intent. And, and as you go through the just culture flowchart or framework, um, I'm paraphrasing, but I believe you know one of the principles there is this question of a substitution test. Would a similar professional, had another nurse been in that all help role that day in that situation, would another nurse have possibly or likely made the same mistake? It seems, uh, curious to hear your thoughts of somewhat likely, quite certainly could have happened to somebody else. Curious to hear your thoughts on sort of like that random, <clears throat> of, uh, she was trying to do her job and look what happened. You know, I'll, I'll jump in and answer this, uh, take the first stab at this. So um, I agree 100%. Um, we have, and a lot of people have, I would say a lot of the um, high-performing institutions uh, have RN peer review committees, which function just like a physician peer review. Uh, Non-punitive, um, it is an evaluation of practice by their peers. Uh, so there's no management, there is, there's, there's no punitive nature, but they ask those exact questions, Mark, that you just brought up. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what were the, what was the environment like that day? Um, mm -hmm. Kind of what were the external variables that came into play? And given this situation, how would other people have reacted? Uh, and I think that's key to help kind of diagnose what the problems are to go back to that individual failure or system failure, and then mitigate, make those changes and implement them um, as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll just add, I think it's important to understand a little bit of the background. Um, so the patient was a step down patient. Um, she was not in the ICU, but she still required a step down. There's a certain amount of monitoring and vital signs and things like they, they get. So part of nursing's workaround sometimes is that when a patient needs to go for a scan or off the floor, the nurse has a dilemma. The nurse can accompany the patient 
and monitor them, but then their other patients are left on the floor and require another nurse to keep an eye on the patient. And I've often said, if you, a step down nurse maybe has three patients at a time. If they came in that morning and had a six patient assignment, they would say, I'm not taking this, it's not safe. But suddenly it's lunchtime and it's an hour and suddenly you're taking six patients. And so the nurse had obtained an order, Ethan had obtained an order that, that Ms. Murphy could go down non-monitored. So my argument is it wasn't just the medication that killed Ms. Murphy. It was the fact that the patient was not monitored by a nurse, but this was the best that nursing could do. Because if you even look at Redonda was in a help all position, but she was still doing more things than she, I mean, she couldn't even stay with the patient because she was doing something else. And this is so common. And I bet if, even if you look at, you know, transport statuses of, of many hospitals, that's still kind of the way things are done is nurses are trying to juggle things just so they can accomplish all their tasks. And yet that puts patients in a different kind of, um, yeah. you know, safety crunch. And, 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 and that all seems to me like there are system design flaws in, in that environment. There was a comment from Diana in the chat, and we do encourage people, you can submit questions through the Q and A. Um, we've got robust use of the chat here, which I appreciate. But Diana made a comment, I would like to get your reactions. Um, she said, we also need to discuss how Redonda and Ethan were younger nurses. Being a resource nurse and orientating a new grad is a lot of responsibility for somebody who is you know, relatively inexperienced. Um, Rebecca, I see you nodding your head. Do you have some thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think that just just to think this is, is I think so many of us feel that we could be run down to that because that situation has been in the minds. It's been there. How many of us have made near misses? How many of us have made our own medication errors? And we could be facing that criminal prosecution. I will raise my hand. It's going. To, it was me. It could have been me. It could have been anybody on this call. And I think we're missing that. I think that the general public doesn't understand that really every nurse why they're petrified is because they've all been in this situation where they know that they've had a near miss or made a mistake that potentially caused harm or could have caused harm and the outcomes just were so very different. So what we're experiencing in our workforce today is the average age of a nurse in this country is over the age of 50. 50% 50 of that workforce is over 50. 70% is over the age of 40. So what we're finding though is that we graduate 175,000 nurses a year but the scariest statistic is even up in that 2017 50% of nurses that were at the bedside within two years left the practice of nursing right they were leaving. And this year, the largest demographic that is leaving nursing in, in its entirety is nurses with less than one year of experience. And the truth is, it's suddenly all of this knowledge of experienced nurses is gone. They, they have left. They are gone. This is a major crisis of what's going on in the industry. And the reality is, is did we just further kick a profession that was down? And this lack of experience, because let's be very honest, and Dr. Japikins, and I think you can speak to this. The truth is, is we know you can be as good as you are coming out of school from a knowledge perspective of education. But the reality is, is there really is value in experience. And when you have a nurse with two years of experience, being the nurse to train another brand new nurse in a highly intensive environment, the likelihood that mistakes are going to happen are going to go through the roof. Like the, the reality is in medical school, you have residency with really experienced physicians to teach you that knowledge so that they have that. What we have in our world today is really inexperienced nurses training really inexperienced experienced nurses. And that is why we're seeing these problems go on. And that has to be fixed. I mean, I, I, the more I listen to this, I, I, I don't know if the people that were involved in the trial realized just how much harm was called. Redonda, she so could have easily pulled out that vial from her pocket and gone Oh no, and thrown it away. Mm -hmm. Like, and that is essentially what is going to happen at a much higher, that has already happened. It's probably happening right now where someone is realizing they made a mistake and caused harm and is making a decision to not report that um, even before this case. Mm -hmm. So now you're looking at that going, oh, if I report this, I could go to jail. Right. For that, well, what, there's there's just zero incentive at that point, and no one would have ever known why that person mm -hmm. um, had a respiratory arrest. I mean, mm -hmm. they were in the ICU. Maybe they had a PE and just died on the on the MRI table. You know, so I just it's to me it's it's this issue that I, I get it. The people that 
probably made the prosecutor thought they were doing something right or good in in what they were. I don't think they woke up and said, "Oh, how can we make healthcare less safe today?" Oh, well, let's go put someone in jail that did the right thing by reporting a mistake. I mean, it, there should never be a system in which you can accidentally give vecaronium. Yeah. Instead of like, there should just that system should not occur. We we can do so many amazing things as humans. Certainly, we could uh, figure that system out. Um, I please, um, Kelly, you should we should put that article, the article that mm -hmm. you, you forwarded. Um, I just thought it was great because the that that nursing um, association published in 2016 a whole mm -hmm. bunch of safety recommendations for this exact situation. Right. I mean, just right. so it's so who's who's at fault there? I mean, if, right. if we're going to continue to create a culture of, of fault, it's going to a culture which is already sweeping things under the rug is going to do that more and more. It's going to increase the distrust um, that already exists, I think, with um, um, the, the lay population and healthcare. Mm -hmm. It's not going to increase increase things. It's it's really hard to understand. So I went out to dinner last night. Um, so my wife's a, an ER doctor. Um, we went out to dinner with a couple. He's a dermatologist, and and she is in business, so she's on healthcare. And so I said, um, oh well, I'm giving this 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 panel tomorrow. You know, Colby, what do you think? Sarah, what do you think? And in her perspective, um, was so interesting. I mean, the, the doctor was like, yeah, I mean, this is this is making healthcare less safe. <laughs> it's, it's perpetuating, a, a, um, it's making a bad culture even worse. Um, and then we started talking about, um, ab about, oh, well, giving an IV medication. And, and her comment was, yeah, that sounds like a really dangerous thing to do, giving an IV medication. And, and I was like, I mean, are you kidding me? Like, uh, how many times you order multiple IV medications per patient? She probably gave, you know, 80 IV medications that day. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. these, these are not like, oh, well, this happened once in, in the month and this was this really high risk situation. And so, so to, to think that, to think that lay people could have any understanding of the situation. So right before we got on, there was a comment about the military. Um, I'd love to hear people's thoughts about, like, there, there are certain places in which people can, can judge and really look to see was this an individual error or was this a systemic error? Um, number one. And then number two, we just need to be really careful. If we are going down this route of, of, of criminally putting people away, it, we are hopeless of ever trying to make the system any better. I mean, it is just completely off the table. And so to think that this could go to, um, to, to lay people to have any understanding um, is just, it's, it's a real shame. Um, and so... Brian? Yeah. And, you know, you know, Brian talked about high reliability organizations and, um, you know, high, high reliability fixes for things are making it so that you can't open a package or so that, you know, like Vanderbilt ended up, um, you can only access a paralytic now by typing in P-A-R-A -A for paralytic. So you can't even find it by typing in the name of the drug. And, and the least reliable way of making people safe is through training and education. And guess Be what we careful. do to nurses yeah. every time that there's some kind of event is we get some kind of new training and something else for nurses to do. I think uh, Dr. Jacobson, I, it might be interesting to go down kind of the pre-discussion we had about, you know, if we're going to. Um, evaluate this um, cases like this, who really should do that because of, uh, to your point, the layman's term. But to go back to something Rebecca said, uh, we knew there was a nursing shortage you know, in, in 2017. We knew where this was going to go. And as a, as a result of that, the nursing schools are, are trying to help solve that for us. So they're increasing their graduating classes. We've got online programs, hybrid programs, second degree programs. So those um, early careerists are coming into the workforce. And, and now fast forward to 2022, many of them just lost an entire year of clinicals um, due, to the, due to the pandemic. So the nurses we're getting now, the situation we're putting them in, you know, is right for that Swiss cheese model. And I saw a lot of comments about you know, having a, a robust residency program or new grad program. Uh, and I, I, I agree, I, I think that is the right way to go. Not the, not the one solution, um, cause there, there needs to be a multifaceted solution here, but you can't just take them off orientation and kind of throw them, kind of throw them into this environment. So you have to have that infrastructure in place to, for ongoing education, uh, and an avenue for, uh, continued learning. 
And I saw in the chat, market, um, somebody asked, like, what are we going to do about this, mm -hmm. right? And I think many of us are still reeling from the impact because many people reach out to me saying, can I keep practicing? Is it safe? Mm -hmm. Would you tell your kids to become nurses? And my husband and I sat down and I said, you know, I, we have three kids. Like, is it worth me going in and picking up patients, making a mistake, and so that I could go to jail because I was doing the best job that I possibly could? And the absolute answer is no. It's just, it's not worth it. That risk is not worth it. So in that situation that those do happen, those errors are going to get pushed underground. If we as a community don't come together and demand that we create safe harbors for those working in healthcare without intent. So that is the first thing we should be demanding. We should be calling. We should say, this is a safe harbor case. And the truth is, if you feel that we need more investigation, it's time to set up similar things, similar to military tribunals for healthcare errors that could lead to greater implication. A jury by your peers is going to be defined by those peers of you who you work with in these systems of high complexity. These nurse residency programs, as Brian says, absolutely important. He's also talking about this third set of eyes that he'll explain a little bit further, which using technology to back up the systems. But lastly, we oh, and are two more things. Hospitals need to defend their nurses. They don't. In this criminal prosecution, what you may not be aware of is the malpractice insurance that Verdon Devot carried does not cover her criminal charges. When you're charged criminally, that's a personal expense. She has spent nearly a quarter of a million dollars in her defense. And nurses can't afford to do that. And we know right now there's two other criminal prosecutions of nurse, one within a jail setting and one who just pleaded out in long-term care because of criminal prosecutions that are going after them for mistakes due to system failures. And the last thing, if you are listening and you are a healthcare executive and you are a nurse listening, it is time that we as nurses demand that if products and processes are being rolled out into us by other companies, there should be a nurse executive at their company. If there is not a nurse executive at their organization, I no longer trust in them to have done the research to look at that their device is safe for us to use. And I think that is a power and we as nurses really need to take back and own and say, unfortunately, I don't feel safe working in an environment environment that does not have nurse approved signs off on medication systems, programs, and uh, processes and technologies that allow us to engage to better fix these. So if we're going to go forward, we have to be aggressive, we have to be hard, and we have to be very forthcoming with what we need as a workforce to make it feel safe for us to practice. And so as we talk about what we can do or need to do moving forward, it seems like there's a couple broad categories. There are uh, you know, maybe societal legal reforms, the safe harbor idea maybe is in that category. Um, if there's advocacy that can be done um, with legislators. At a, yeah, and Mark, speak to level. the AV, you, you've spoken to me in the past about the aviation industry. If they report an error, or mis can you, you speak to that better than well, that they, they, There's a national system for um, reporting of errors and near misses, and it's um, intentionally designed as a non-punitive system. You have a National tra Transportation Safety Board that comes in and investigates train accidents, plane crashes. There are people right now advocating and pushing really hard for a National Patient Safety Board that would have maybe additional oversight. Um, and then you know, there, there's that question of how do you set up additional reporting um, in medicine that would have similar non-punitive, um, but you know, there's that question of even if society is not being punitive, is the organization being impunit, uh, punitive? So it seems like there, there's, there's culture and leadership challenges. Maybe we can talk more about that. And then there's technologies, um, and I would include lean as one of those technologies of, as people have mentioned in the comments, the need to error-proof, um, mm -hmm. need to have better systems, the need to have better checks that work properly. So, you know, in those different categories, I'm, I'm, I'm curious which of you would want to touch on either kind of societal level management and culture or technologies of things that we need to do. I mean, I've devoted my life to lean. So that that that's a, a clear thing that I can um, touch on. And, you know, when I, I got interested in Kaizen, continuous improvement lean, it, it, to me, it was so obvious that you just don't have. 99.9999%. I'm not talking about the, the weird neurologist who did all that um, stuff in, in Dallas, but like right. one out of, a, a, you know, the vast majority of people going into healthcare want to do good. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly complex system that's incredibly broken that has competing priorities. And so once I learned about these improvement principles, it became so obvious to me that, that this, this is the path forward for healthcare to get better. 
um, this this practice discipline of asking people how things can get better, of looking at waste, of error proofing, and of doing all the other things in lean. I mean, that's essentially the founding of Kinexus. And so um, th there is n there is no question that if we want to have a safer healthcare system, um, putting people behind bars if they make a mistake uh, will not result in that. But um, you know, triple downing on improvement um, principles um, and, and lean is you know to me you know the the gold standard for that is going to be the path forward. So I, I just think anyone that knows anything about healthcare or working in really specialized systems and then knows about improvement work, it, it's so obvious. Um, uh, the path forward. Just a quick interjection. There was a question from Jason who asked, is lean thinking a part of a nurse's training? I, from, from what I've heard, it's extremely rare for physicians or nurses or other medical professionals to hear about lean during their education. You know, I'll, uh, I'll jump in there. I agree with you. It's not common practice, but I, I will challenge my executive peers um, who are out there. Uh, it's, we need to be on these nursing boards for the local nursing schools. We need to help them connect what they're training them with to pre best prepare them for the realities of what the environment is. And I'll give kudos to Purdue, Purdue University um, School of Nursing because uh, we had this very same conversation a couple of years ago. And they, they began incorporating lean methodologies into their BSN programs. Uh, now they had to kind of do the start, stop, continue. And I don't know what fell out of their curriculum, but they did bring uh, lean philosophies in and they would do, the students would be expected to do projects. And um, when they graduated, you know, that was one of the highlights they put on their resume. Uh, it's definitely not broad, uh, but it is something that, you know, they need to be familiar with, especially as healthcare systems um, start to adopt um, kind of th these foundational practices. I also think that um, the culture has to change uh, at the local level and nationally to where doctors aren't seen as the expert about everything and nurses are included as a voice. I was just actually looking at something online and there was some sort of patient safety national conference coming up and there was not one nurse who was going to be a keynote speaker on there. They were all physicians. And so I think it's it's time that we not just, you know, kind of asked to be at the table, but we demand to be at the table for all of these discussions. I wanted to ask as a follow-up, you know, back to the question of not just attracting people to nursing, but retaining them. Um, there's a lot of discussion about pay, pay and nurses leaving to go be a traveler, but it seems like what's discussed less are working conditions. Uh, there's a comment here from Barbara says, I've been a nurse uh, for more than 40 years. Nurse patient ratios are the same now as they were when I began my career, but patient acuity is so much higher. There's more equipment, there's more processes. This is one of the main reasons nurses leave. So, you know, in the context of lean, it's, it's not just a matter of waste, but a matter of overburden. I'm curious to hear the thoughts. Mark, I, and I think actually, I'm so glad we're saying this because the reality is, is there is a hidden cost here that nobody is talking about. Since the development of Medicare and Medicaid in this country, nurses were rolled into room rates for hospital reimbursement. This has not changed in 100 years. And what that means is nurses are put on the cost side of healthcare systems. And as a business, we de-invest in cost. So more nurses equal more costs without associated revenues. Whereas if you look at any other provider, more doctors equal more costs, but associated revenues. OTs, more OTs equal more o uh, cost, but more revenues. The reality is this antiquated system in which we reimburse nurses tied into room rates based largely on sexist policies dating back from the 1920s women's suffrage movement to keep nurses away from the money is absolutely fundamentally destroying our ability in healthcare to look through lean policies to say it's not a budget issue, it's a safety issue. And if we could actually fund and support nursing the way that it deserves to be represented, which is very easily done with the new HR system, so we need a national provider number for nurses, that in one stroke of a pen would change the dynamic within the industry today to fund nursing, drive it forward, and create the systems and so, uh, movements forward to sustainably create a nursing workforce that is sustainable, investable, and scalable. And until we do that, unfortunately, we are going to be in many of the situations and in the conversations that we have today. There was um, a, a question submitted um, that, among other things, asked 
Um, what's the minimum and maximum Ms. Vaught may be sentenced? So the news article here says could face up to eight years in prison. And I'll, I'll just add, I mean, there has been a public outcry. 200,000 people have signed an online petition urging clemency. The Tennessee governor, the ball's in his court. He has said, no, he's not going to grant clemency, unfortunately. There's um, another question here. None of us um, are, are pharmacists, but what about the accountability um, toward the pharmacy? Why is there why has there been a focus only on the nurse in this case? Um, I can answer. I do know that um, the risk manager for Vanderbilt reached out to the the pharmacist when this happened, and they ran kind of an audit report to see did the Pixis machine malfunction in some way? And interestingly, the Pixis machine did not malfunction. It so, so everything went as the Pixis machine was designed. Nobody did anything wrong, but it was very poor design. And so um, a pharmacist didn't do anything incorrect, incorrectly. Now there's been a case in the past, there was a, a pharmacist named like Eric Kropp, I believe his name yes. was, and he went to prison because yeah. A technician that he was supervising um, put together a chemotherapy drug with 23% saline instead of normal saline, and the, and and the the child died. Um, Eric Crop had worked like 48 hours in the prior three days. There was you know a number of other factors, but he in fact did did go to jail, and now he goes around actually with that patient's father, and they do patient safety talks. Chris Jerry, um, I've met and I've interviewed him in a podcast before. And Chris Jerry, from the get go, was saying that it's not right to prosecute the pharmacist Eric Kropp. And um, they, they, like you said, they go around together and it's very powerful. Which is a scene. similar situation here, right? The family of this patient did not want this case criminally right. prosecuted. Yeah. This and is at least uh, Chris, Chris was opposed to it. His yeah. Um. I, I'd like to share the, the link with the ISMP article, Kelly, that you, it's a criminalization of human error and a guilty verdict, a travesty of justice. At the end. I just I, I thought it was excellent. It's easy to read, well written. It goes through um, all the major kind of points. Uh, one of the areas that we have not spent time on, and, and I'm kind of glad we didn't because we we don't have legal background, but there were a lot of issues with the trial. Um in itself, and so it, this does a nice job of, of highlighting those. And then importantly, it has a link at the very bottom to the petition that Mark mentioned, and I just signed it um, this morning. I think it might be up to 300,000 now. Um, okay. So that's something that's easy um, that, yeah. that you can there, do. There's been more and more attention. There are more and more op-eds. I get a daily Google news alert on the phrase patient safety. And I swear to God, one day when there are op-eds in publications, Forbes, ultra, I say this, you know, you know kind of it's an uber capitalist publication and the world socialist workers news are both publishing op-eds saying that this is an injustice, then it might, I mean, it, it screams injustice of people. If that far across the economic or political spectrums are speaking mm. out about this, um, that's, that's rare and unusual, I think. I think the reality is, is we know the light is being shined on this one case, but we don't know the number of nurses currently being criminally charged across the country, but we do know that it's probably a significantly significant number, knowing that three cases have made the news in the course of the last two weeks. The reality is, is that we cannot let this issue rest, even if clemency is captioned here, because the risk to the profession and to healthcare overall is what is at risk here. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, if I'm looking at all of the nurses that are tuning in and saying, how do we go forward from here? And how do you get a seat at the table? The truth is, is that you're going to have to make your own table. And that means you're going out on social, you're advocating, you're getting your voice out there. I know that we have restrictive policies by many of our, our, our organizations that employ us, but the reality is there comes a time that we have a chance for a change. And sometimes the greatest horrific thing that happens allows us to drive meaningful change. So I want you to take that with you. I don't want you to feel as helpless as you are right now, because for the first time as nurses, and what I can say my lifetime, 
we actually have people external to nursing paying attention to the pains of what our profession is doing and experiencing and willing to potentially listen to the most trusted profession and actually help us try to create some sustainability here. So don't be scared of not going out and speaking and, and doing this, but Brian, Kelly. Yeah, no, I, com I completely agree. Um, the pandemic, I'm glad we didn't have this discussion go there much. I think I probably mentioned it the most, but that has put a spotlight on the profession. This case has as well. Um, and it's going to take people like uh, us, you get the audience, uh, Rebecca, Kelly, myself, really being active um, and keeping this on the forefront to elicit change. And uh, I don't have a specific definition of what change I'm looking for, but uh, across the board and to this case, you know, criminalizing people, uh, headlines calling her a murderer like that, that's unacceptable. Right. Um, we right. cannot move forward with there. We, we, this case has put us a, a step in the direction to uh, worst case imaginable for me at least. Uh, and this is it being a common practice to cover up and not bring errors forward um, or which really identify gaps and processes, which other people are going to fall in. And it, you know, it's just one bad outcome after the other. So that, that, that worries me. And I appreciate and Brian, that, you're, that you're talking about the need, um, you know, for, uh, as an executive to look at culture. Um, it's, it's more difficult to maybe now to create a culture where it's safe for people to speak up. We can say it's safe to speak up. And if people didn't believe it to begin with or they point to this case <laughs> as more reason to disprove it, unfortunately, that that's that's a heavier lift. But we, we need to keep at it. So thank you, Brian, for that. Other comments as we're starting to wrap up here, maybe we just do um, kind of around the horn if everyone's got a final thought to share about one minute each. Do we have a volunteer um, to go first? I'll go first. I'll kind of uh, wrap it up. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate uh, being on this panel. Uh, to the rest of the panel, uh, this has been great discussion. You know, my takeaways, uh, I'm not sure who exactly the audience is, but if you are a system leader, um, I think you need to take away that you need to push to put infrastructures in place, um, help drive culture. Culture does come top down. Um, put those infrastructures in place for high reliability and lean methodologies. Uh, if you're a student uh, listening to this, um, you know, we used to tell students when you graduate in the interview, you know, you want to go to a magnet facility and ask people where they are. Uh, if they're a magnet facility. And I'm not saying don't do that, but I think the more important question right now today is ask your potential employer uh, about their just culture. Uh, and if they can't explain um, what they have in place for that, uh, you definitely need to weigh that into your decision if that's a company you want to work for, especially in light of this, uh, this case. Um, and then to what Rebecca said, I can't echo this enough. You know, if you are bringing new technology in, you're dealing with new technologies, they, they must have a nurse on the board, um, help with the design team um, to identify, is this a real problem? Uh, does this solve a problem for nurses? And if it doesn't, we can't be bringing that in the hospital saying it's latest and greatest. They need to be building technology and making decisions with nurses at that table. And if they're not, uh, get yourself on that table. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts. Yeah. Rebecca. I'll be real quick on mine, just following up on Brian. The reality is, is that for too many times when you're doing system improvements, it's always just adding more work to, on the back of the nurse. It's like, oh, we're going to fix this. And look at who's going to operationalize it. Always the nurse. I left a health systems design conference this week and every single solution was, oh, the nurse is going to do it. The reality is nurses can't continue to do it all. We need to start trimming the trees. We need to, as Brian said, look at technology, not solving a problem just because those who invented the technology thinks it's actually solving. Actually ask the nurse, does this solve the pain point you need or actually ask him what is the pain point that you need solved and what system failures occur that make your job less safe because we as nurses are going to change the future of healthcare if we're given the chance to have that voice kelly or greg greg you're muted i'll just add um I really encourage nurses to educate themselves about the patient safety movement. I think, um, you know, there's a small group of nurses out there, like I said, that really um, find fault with what happened with Redonda. And again, it's not that she doesn't have some faults, but I think it's it. I think once you educate yourself about all the factors that go into play in errors, um, then you can more easily advocate for the kinds of changes that are really going to make the difference, not just, hey, you need to learn more, but hey, we need to re actually redesign systems for safety. And, and just to, 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 to not be repetitive with, with everyone has said, I think the, I think we've certainly talked about all the systemic negative effects of this case, but if you're looking at this and thinking, oh, well, I would never make that mistake. Um, 
uh, I, I can, there's a hundred percent chance that Redonda did not think um, she was ever um, capable of being a part of that interaction. Um, I mean, keep in mind that she was training someone. So she was a highly respect. You don't give the, the bad doctor, nurse, tech, whatever the person to be trained. And so um, uh, just, this is a, um, it's a time to be reflective, both uh, kind of outwardly as well as inwardly. And, um, and, and, and please just realize that this could have been any of us um, that, that this happened to. Yeah. Well, thanks uh, to all of you, uh, Greg, Kelly, Brian, and Rebecca. There's a lot of thank yous coming in uh, in the chat. Uh, Mary says she had a group of PN students watching in Arkansas, so hello. We don't know how many conference rooms or groups were watching this. Um, the session today was recorded. We will be sending out an email link um, to everybody who registered. We'll be posting it on social media. And we certainly, if you if you found this to be a helpful um, discussion, please do share the link with others and um, we're, we're happy to have you do that. So thank you to everybody who attended. And uh, again, Rebecca, Brian, Kelly, Greg, Thank you for today and, and, and thanks for everything you're going to continue doing um, as advocates and improvement focused leaders.